Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we're having a look at yet another World War II era RCAF navigation instrument. This is a Mark 1A Astrograph, and this is introduced in 1943, and I think it makes a great follow-on and companion piece to my previous video on sextants, which, if you haven't watched it yet, I would highly recommend you do before watching this video because it gives a very good overview of the basics of celestial navigation that we'll need to understand how this device works. But if not, here is an extremely brief overview. So celestial navigation is based on the principle that any celestial object, be it a star, a planet, the sun, or the moon, will appear at a point over the Earth's surface at a particular time of day, at a particular time of year. And that if you measure the altitude of that object, measure its angle from the horizon, and then compare that to data on where it should be, you can then determine your own position on the Earth's surface. So for example, in order to get a celestial position fix, you would first need something called your assumed position. This is where you think you are. And this is typically derived via dead reckoning. So using your course, your speed, and elapsed time to figure out how far you've traveled in a particular direction. You would then choose at least three common navigational stars and using your sextant, measure the altitude of each, uh, carefully noting the time at which you took each measurement. You would then look at a document called a nautical almanac and find out the positions of those three stars at the times you took your measurements. Then using that data and your measurements, as well as formulas or navigational tables, if you don't have a calculator handy, you can then reduce all of this to three um, north-south latitude positions and azimuth bearings, so compass headings. And when you apply these to your assumed position, all three lines should converge into a triangle commonly known as a cocked hat, which brackets your actual position. And the more accurate your measurements and the more accurate your calculations, the smaller the cocked hat, the more accurate your position fix. Now that is an extremely brief summary of the process, which is actually quite involved because not only is it very difficult to get accurate readings, especially uh, if the atmospheric conditions are not right, if you're in an aircraft, if the stars are particularly dim, but you have to account for a lot of different corrections. So for example, you have to account for the fact that you're not lying down right on the horizon, you're actually standing a couple of feet above it. Uh, there are atmospheric distortions, there are distortions inherent to the sextant itself. If you're taking a sight through the plexiglass astrodome of an aircraft that also introduces refraction error, and all of these things can add up, and it takes a lot of time, around 20 minutes sometimes, to get your position fixed. And if you're traveling at high speed, say in a bomber aircraft heading over occupied Europe during the Second World War, every minute it takes for you to determine your position will send you dozens of kilometers off course before you can make a correction. So navigational experts were constantly looking for means of speeding up this process, making it faster to actually fix your position. And one of the cleverest methods was developed by a Lieutenant Commander Philip Weems, who was a navigational expert for the U.S. Navy in the 1930s and 1940s. And Weems actually came up with a number of different innovations, including the Weems plotter, still used today, and the Weems bezel, which was a rotating bezel on a wristwatch that allowed servicemen to synchronize the second hand. But according to Weems himself, his greatest accomplishment was developing the method of stellar altitude curves. So if you'd watched my video on sextants, you know that the spot on the Earth's surface directly below a celestial object, like a star, is known as the substellar point. And if you imagine the Earth rotating beneath that point, it's going to trace out a curve over the Earth's surface. Now, if you're standing directly on the substellar point, the star in question is going to appear as though it is directly above you. Its altitude will be 90 degrees. But if you move in any direction away from that star, due to the curvature of the Earth, its altitude will start to decrease. 
But if you move the same distance in any direction, the decrease in altitude will also be the same. So if you imagine drawing a series of concentric circles at various distances away from the substellar point, if you are anywhere on one of those circles, then the decrease in altitude of the star will be the same. Think of it as the contour lines on a relief map that show areas of equal elevation. Now, one last thing to imagine is take these concentric circles and sweep them across the Earth's surface uh, along with the substellar point, you'll end up with a series of parallel curves, and these are the stellar altitude curves. Now, what Weems did, which is super clever, was to arrange the stellar altitude curves of two separate stars on the same chart, but perpendicular, so that they actually cross each other. And to use one of these charts, what you would do is you would take altitude readings with a sextant of the two stars specified on the chart. You would then find the curves that corresponded to the altitudes you measured and find the spot where they crossed. Now from that spot, you can either go to one axis of the chart and find the local sidereal time, time according to the stars. And you would either add or subtract this from the local time of the first point of Aries. Again, go to my video on sextants to figure out what that is, uh, to figure out your longitude. You could also go the other direction on the other scale of the chart to determine directly your latitude. And this works because there's only one combination of longitude and latitude where those two stars will have those specific altitudes at that specific time of day and year. So extraordinarily clever and elegant system. And a very fast one too. In fact, Weems himself claimed that this could increase the speed of making a position fix using two stars by fivefold. So the US Navy, who he worked for, as well as the US Army Air Force, were extremely enthusiastic and immediately adopted these curves and later so did the RAF, the RCAF, and the other Commonwealth Air Forces. Now, as fast as that method was, uh, people were still looking for ways of doing it even faster, and that's why the astrograph was invented. The purpose of the astrograph was to further increase the speed at which you could use stellar altitude charts uh, by projecting the curves directly onto a map. So rather than looking up your longitude and latitude on a separate chart and transferring them to your map, you could instantly pinpoint where you were on the map itself. So this is actually just a very simple projector, and this would be mounted on a special bracket above the navigator's map table and would be used in conjunction with a specially printed map with a one to one millionth scale. And this is really a very simple device. You have a metal casing, you have two glass sheets here with a little uh, gap a couple of millimeters between them. You have a lamp in the back which is powered by the aircraft's 12 volt power system. And then you have these two reels and these would be loaded with a 50-foot acetate strip printed with the stellar altitude curves. And that would go from one reel between the glass sheets and to the other reel, very much like the film in a camera, or if your school had those old school projectors, overhead projectors, that had the continuous acetate uh, strip on them. Exact same principle. And that would project the stellar altitude curve directly onto the map below. And you had the selection of several different film strips for this uh, because these would correspond to different slices of latitude and longitude. Because this was very uh, cumbersome to reload in midair, you would want your entire film strip to last the entirety of your mission, which is why they were so long. Now, as you can imagine, for this to work, the scale of the projection and the scale of the map need to line up perfectly. And this is the reason that the astrograph was provided with this. This is actually a spacer rod. It screws together. And this would allow you to set the precise distance between the face of the astrograph and the surface of the navigation table to ensure that the scale of the curves themselves was correct. And then 
to adjust it side to side, you would just turn these knobs to advance or rewind the acetate film. And then to adjust the uh, image up and down, the light bulb in the back, the lamp, is mounted on a track with a knob and you just twist the knob and it moves the light bulb up and down and the projected image moves along with it. Now, this seems simple enough, but there's actually something weird about the design of this device, and that's that it doesn't have a lens or any other means of focusing the image. And this is bizarre because by 1943, you know, this is not new technology. Magic lanterns have been around for you know, 100, 200 years, uh, and yet nobody thought to provide this with a lens. The earlier versions, the ones manufactured in the US, had sort of a mechanism for focusing. You could actually uh, screw the light bulb in and out, and that would sort of focus the image. But this doesn't even have that. The light bulb isn't mounted uh, axially, it's mounted laterally. So you can't adjust its distance from this plate here. So if this was built slightly off, if the depth, uh, the distance between the light bulb and the glass was just slightly off, then your image would be horribly blurry and unusable. So again, really don't know why they designed it that way. They could have easily made this into a conventional projector with a lens. Just one of those strange design mysteries. So despite the fact that this was designed to speed up the process of getting a position fix, this is a pretty finicky and complicated device to use. Not least of which, as I said before, uh, because it's very difficult to actually focus the image on your map. Also, you would have to continuously scroll through your film strip as you flew along uh, just to make sure that your stellar altitude curves were aligned based on the time at which you took your stellar altitude measurements. You have to stay on top of it to make sure that your chart wasn't misaligned and it didn't throw off all of your measurements. But more than that, what's strange is that the film strips, the stellar altitude curves you were using, were based not on Greenwich Mean Time or Sidereal Time based on the first point of Aries, but rather something called Astrograph Mean Time. And how this worked is that when you were setting up the astrograph before a flight, you would have to decide at what time were you going to take your first altitude measurement. You would then open up your nautical almanac and find within the nearest hour uh, what the position of the star Aries was. And you would then use this to create a reference meridian. So this was completely arbitrary. And so rather than basing all your measurements off of the prime meridian running through Greenwich or the first point of Aries, as you would if you were using sidereal time, all of your measurements would be based off of this arbitrary meridian, which could be pretty much anywhere on the map, that was entirely based on when you took your first measurement and where in the world you are. So very strange system, and I imagine it added some time to the setup and confused many a navigator. But Despite these complications, with sufficient practice, I imagine you could get very good at using one of these and it would significantly speed up the, the time it took to get a position fix. So you would imagine based on this that when this device entered service in 1943 that it would have been very popular among navigators and would have been very successful and widely distributed throughout the RAF and RCAF. But no, that's actually not the case. Uh, this was actually very short-lived in RAF and RCAF service, and they're pretty obscure today and hard to find because of that. And the reason for this lack of popularity is really twofold. Number one, ironically, navigators actually preferred the old method of opening up the nautical almanac and getting all the positions and using formulas or the navigation tables to crunch all the numbers and reduce them to azimuth headings and plotting that on a chart and getting your cocked hat and everything like that. They preferred that because, well, that's what they'd been trained to do. By 1943, most of them knew that process like the back of their hands. They knew all the little subtleties and nuances and the tips and tricks and everything like that. It was just what they were familiar with and they really didn't like messing about with something uh, as newfangled and finicky and you know marginally useful as the astrograph. So you know that sort of went out the window. Uh, the other reason really had to do with just bad timing. By 1943, if a navigator wanted a newfangled fancy technological device to play around with, he really had a lot of better choices than the astrograph. Uh, he could use uh, radio navigation aids like OBO or G, um, ground scanning radar like H2S, or even inertial navigation platforms. 
Uh, by the time this came into service, this was really old hat, and it was really too little too late. So you don't hear too much about these today, and they're fairly rare to find in collector circles. But luckily enough, I had a friend who had a complete unit along with the measuring stick, all the acetate film that would have come with it, tools, and a really good quality carrying case. So really neat to look at. And for my money, this is just a really neat device. It's very clever. It's ingenious, in fact, and just an interesting way of solving a particular problem. And it's this interesting midpoint between this very old school uh, method of navigation that had been going on and been used for hundreds of years and this brand new technology of radar and radio communications and inertial platforms and things like that, that would all but replace that. So it's this interesting nexus, this transitional technology that really wasn't all that successful. So just as a bit of a bonus, because I also happen to have one on hand, I thought I might sh briefly show you another navigational instrument from the same time period. So whether you're using an astrograph or the more traditional method of celestial navigation, you're going to need to know the position of the most common navigational stars in the night sky. And in order to determine this, either at the time you're trying to take a star shot or before when you're training and trying to memorize these star positions, you might have used one of these. This is a flower-type planisphere named after its inventor, Lieutenant G.C. Flower. And what this is, is a chart of all the common uh, navigational stars and constellations in the Northern Hemisphere printed on a rotating disk with the time of night printed on the outside of the disk. And this on its own is very useful for finding the most common navigational stars and constellations. But because the positions of the stars change and distort depending on your latitude due to the curvature of the Earth and the distortion of the atmosphere, uh, this actually comes with a number of acetate transparencies to overlay over the planisphere disk. And this shows you the distortion of the celestial sphere and where you'll actually find all of these stars if you look out on the horizon based on your latitude and the time of night. So you would adjust the time of night by rotating the disk. You would adjust the latitude by swapping out one of these transparencies. And there's a number of them provided with the planisphere uh, in increments of 10 degrees of latitude. Now, this is supposed to fit within these two little clips, these little brackets here, but unfortunately, acetate tends to degrade very quickly and distort. You can see this one is all folded up, and so it doesn't actually fit inside the planisphere. Uh, this is also giving off a very strong uh, vinegar odor, so you'll notice uh, things that were made out of acetate uh, back in the 1940s. Uh, when they degrade, they break down to release acetic acid, which is just white vinegar. So when you smell one of these, it smells very strongly of uh, vinegar. So it's one way of identifying early plastics. So I don't actually have a manufactured date for this, uh, although most of the references I found say around 1942. But given that this is in sort of a faux leather case, the materials look a little bit modern. I'm guessing this might have been a version manufactured in the early 1950s, but I'm not quite sure. There's no serial numbers or any dates, not even on the little manual that they have on how to use the planisphere. Anyways, just thought I might show you that because the same friend who loaned me the astrograph also had one of these. So, you know, I, I always like training stuff. It really shows you how they went about teaching these very complicated principles to, you know, apprentice navigators. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. A big shout out to my friend Matt Heinz for providing yet more interesting RCAF gear. Plenty more of that came from his collection is amazing. I'll keep making my way through it as I go along with this channel. Anyway, uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities where we'll look at yet more fascinating artifacts just like these. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.